John. We're going to read the scriptures together. I encourage you to bring your Bibles to church. You can do something. You can do a stranger thing than that. Then bring your Bible to church. And uh, we're going to read together. We'll, we'll read. read uh,
Remember that the church is being attacked and undermined by false teachers that have left the church and split the church and are revisiting people in the church and teaching things about mysticism and Gnosticism uh, were being taught. Gnosticism has to do with Gnosis. Gnosis is the knowledge of spiritual mysteries. So Gnosticism teaches that you can know these spiritual mysteries that are out there and there were people that were teaching, there were false teachers that were claiming special spiritual knowledge, special insight that only they had this Gnosis, this knowledge. They were teaching this sense of Gnosticism that was creeping into the church. And they were disconnecting what they were doing, these people, they were disconnecting belief from behavior. So they were saying they believed certain things, they knew these spiritual mysteries, they had this great spiritual knowledge, this gnosis, and yet their, their behavior did not match what they said they believed. And uh, the, the, there was a disconnect from the spiritual to the material. So that they also denied the physically, physical bodily incarnation of Jesus. And remember John says, we saw him, we touched him with our own hands, and we saw him with our own eyes, and heard him with our own ears. And John emphasizes the physicality, the incarnation of Jesus, the material, the physical, and then against the claims of these teachers that it was all about the spiritual and the ethereal. And so they were disconnecting knowledge and spirituality. There's a lot of that today. A lot of people claim a sense of spirituality. They want a kind of a spirituality in their lives, a, a connection with some kind of spiritual being or spiritual experience. And yet they disconnected that from love and from fellowship and from ethical behavior. They had downgraded the church and the fellowship and the love of God and love of other Christians. They were long rangers, these teachers. They were proud individualists, which is why John writes a lot in this letter about loving one another and about true fellowship and about obeying God's commands. And so all of this was challenging the church. Remember these are second and third generation Christians and, and that fierce flame of devotion was beginning to flicker and there was a sense of drift in the church and a lack of assurance of faith and so John writes these letters uh, to these believers. And he comes up with a number of signs. The people are asking, how can I know that I know God? How can we know that we are Christians? How can we have that assurance? How can I today, how can we today be sure that we are Christians, that we are Christ followers? What are the vital signs of life and true faith that mark us out as true believers? John comes with a number of signs, identifiers. You know, like you have on your dashboard, on your car, that identify kind of what's happening or what's going wrong. John gives various signs as he writes this letter. And he says, this is a sign of true faith. This is a sign that you're following Christ. Uh, and uh, he, he talks and takes on the issue of, of knowledge, of, of this sense of knowing God, gnosis, to know God. Remember Whitney Houston's song, How Will I Know? If He Really Loves Me, I say a prayer with every heartbeat. How will I know? How can I know that I am a Christian? Do I have to feel something special to be a Christian? Do I have to get goosebumps in the service when we're singing certain songs to be a Christian? Do I have to have special spiritual knowledge to be a Christian? How do I know that I know God. How can I know? And John starts to lay out some indications for us. So in chapter 2 of 1 John and verse 3 he says, We know that we have come to know him if, what? If we get goosebumps, <laughs> if we feel something, if we have spiritual experience, if we have special knowledge. That's not what John says. What John says is this in verse of chapter 2. We know that we have come to know him if we obey his commands. And this is the first of John's test. It's an ethical test. It's a moral test. The false teachers, remember, they were disconnecting belief 
from behavior. They were separating the mystical from the moral. They were separating the ethereal from the ethical. They were saying you can know God, you can have this special knowledge, you can have this sense of spirituality, but it doesn't matter how you behave. It doesn't matter how you live your life. It doesn't matter about your ethics or your morality. And John lifts up this moral test, this ethical test, and he says, we know that we have come to know him if we obey his commands. These guys, they were claiming to have knowledge, and yet their lives in no way indicated that they had met, known, or been changed by Jesus. It's not enough just to talk the talk. To fill your head with supposed knowledge of God without actually walking the walk. And this is very similar to what James writes in his letter. He says, in James chapter 2 verse 14, he says, What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say that you have faith, but you don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? And of course, this is in line with what Jesus himself says in the Gospel of John, in John 14 and 15, Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. So true knowledge of God will change you from the inside out. True knowledge of Jesus will transform you and change the way you behave. True knowledge is not just about your talk, it's about your walk. And so verses 3 and 4, we, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands, is a liar. And the truth is not in that person. Just talking about being a Christian and claiming knowledge of God makes you a nominal Christian. A Christian by name only, which is what John was really addressing in his letter. But John says, and James says, and Jesus says, that genuine belief will change your behavior, Amen. will change the way you live your life. And this is, not, this is not legalism. You must do this, and you must do that, and you must follow these rules, and you must follow those rules. That's not what we're talking about here. This is love. This is love for God. But if anyone, verse 5, if anyone obeys his word, love for God, is truly made complete in that person. It's not sure in, in the original, it's a bit of debate on whether that's love for God or the love of God, uh, but the love of God, the love for God, is made complete in that person when we obey God's word. And again, this lines up with Jesus' teaching. Jesus said in John chapter 15 verse 10, if you keep my commands, you will remain in my love just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in His love. The message version says, if you keep my commands, you will remain intimately at home in my love. This is love in action. The love of God at work in you when you obey Him. And the more that we know Jesus, the more that we will love Him. And the more that we love Jesus, the more that we will do and want to do what pleases Him. Just like a man or a woman who's deeply in love and seeks to please <coughs> their wife or their husband or a friend who loves and cares deeply for another friend and is motivated by love towards that person, so too when we know and when we love God, we simply want to do what pleases Him. The love of God starts to be made complete in us as we obey Him, as we Follow his commands. This isn't legalism. You must do this and you must do that. This is love for God working out into our lives and into our behavior and changing us 
from the inside out. It's a vital sign of life. It's a sign of true faith in Christ's followers. So these characters, these false <laughs> teachers, are saying that they know God. They are Gnostics. They are saying, we have the Gnosis. We have the knowledge of God more than you do. We have the knowledge of spiritual mysteries. But they behave like the devil. Their special spiritual knowledge is all in their head. But there's no fruit. There's no outworking. There are no signs of genuinely knowing Jesus and being changed by his presence. And so verses 5b and 6 says, By this we may know that we are in him, in Jesus, in Christ. Whoever says that he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Or as some versions say, ought to live as Jesus lived. If you say that you are in Christ, if you say that you abide in Him, then your walk needs to match your talk. You, you ought to live as Jesus lived. That's a sign of genuine faith. This is how we know that we are in Him, that we are Christians, in relationship with Jesus, knowing Him. We walk like Jesus walked. We don't just talk the talk, we walk the walk. We don't walk like an Egyptian, we walk like a Christian. <laughs> so let's read these verses again, verses 3 to 6 of chapter 2 in the message version, and let it sink in to, to us <coughs> what is being said here. Here's how we can be sure that we know God in the right way. Keep His commandments. If someone claims, I know him well, but doesn't keep his commandments, he obviously is a liar. His life doesn't match his words. But the one who keeps God's word is the person in whom we see God's mature love. This is the only way to be sure we're in God. Anyone who claims to be intimate with God ought to live the same kind of life that Jesus lived. Now the order here is important. There's a book by Simon, Simon Benham, a pastor, and it's called The Peach and the Coconut. A coconut approach to church and to life and to faith, a coconut is hard on the outside, but when you get in, there's not much on the inside. And so a coconut approach to faith and to church and to Christ puts behavior first on the outside, to belong to be part of this church, you have to behave right. You have to behave in a certain way to be acceptable. So you behave first, and then you believe, and then you can belong. So the coconut, hard on the outside, hard to get in, not much on the inside. So you've got you've to gotta behave first, you've got to line up your behavior first, get your life sorted out, behave in the right way, and then you can believe in God and come to faith, and then you can belong and be part of the body of Christ. A peach approach is different. A peach is soft on the outside, but it's hard on the inside. It's got a hard core. And it turns us around and it says that you belong first. You can belong. Come and be a part of us. And then you believe and come to faith. And then you start to behave differently. And the order is important. Your behavior, the ethics, the outworking come from genuine faith. So you can belong here if your life is not lined up and you've got mess in your life and not everything is okay and you've got sin and you've got failures. You can belong to this body and you can come and join us. And we believe that as you open your life and as we open our lives to Christ and as we believe in Him and put our faith in Him, that we start to be changed from the inside out. And our behavior starts to change. We don't want to act like we used to act. We don't want to talk like we used to talk. We don't want to do the things that we used to do. 
And when we still mess up as we do, and when we still sin as we do, as John reminded us, we have an advocate, we have an atonement who atones for our sin, an atoning sacrifice, we have one who purifies us and cleanses us from sin, but doesn't exclude us from belonging. We belong, we belong, we believe. And then the behavior starts to change and starts to work out into our lives. You need a savior before you change your behavior. Amen. You can't change your behavior first. Get yourself right, line yourself up, sort your life out, and then you might consider this faith thing. You might become a Christian when you've sorted it all out. It's not like that. You need a savior first. And then your behavior will start to change. And that's what genuine Christianity looks like. It changes you from the inside out, not from the outside in. It's not us imposing regulations and rules. It's not legalism. It's not you must, you must, you must. And sometimes when people come into the church and their lives are messed up and their lifestyles are not quite lined up with biblical morality, sometimes as Christians, established Christians, we might be attempted to sort those people out, to line them up. You're doing that wrong and you're doing that wrong. But sometimes we need to step back and let the Holy Spirit do His work. We teach the truth. We believe the truth of the Word of God. We believe what the Bible says about, the, about ethics and morality and sexuality. We believe what the Bible says. And we teach what the Bible says. And we step back and we allow that belief and that work of the Holy Spirit to start to change our lives and our behaviors. It's not that we police one another in that sense. But by the Word and the Spirit of God, we start to change from the inside out. And that's when we know that the love of God is starting to be perfected in us. That we're starting to show signs of mature love, signs of change, signs of faith. And this is what John is saying. When people meet Jesus, they are changed. Their behavior changes. Their 